Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I've been thinking about something this past week. Let me ask you a question. Do you think Jesus was a nice guy? Let me pause for a moment. You know what the answer is, or at least what the answer should be. You know it's been ingrained in you since maybe you were a kid. But was he a nice guy? Let's assume he was a nice guy. And uh, what stories in the Bible would you point to saying, yeah, that's a nice guy? He said, let the children come to me. That was good. He included women, which were second-class citizens back then. That was nice. He fed 5,000 people. He healed the people, especially like the lepers who were outsiders and, and couldn't be allowed in. He said, blessed are the poor. That's nice. He died for the sins of the world. That's super nice, isn't it? Now flip it around. What stories would suggest that Jesus wasn't a nice guy? Maybe when he started calling people names. Peter, he called Satan. Pharisees, he called whitewashed tombs and snakes. Maybe when he flipped over the table of the money changers there in the temple. That wasn't nice. Maybe when he waited four days before, after Lazarus died, he could have been there. He could have done something. Or when the people started following him after he fed the 5,000, he said, you only are here because you want your bellies filled again. Or last week when we showed the frustration when he said, how much longer do I have to put up with you people? He said that if you didn't believe, you'd be spending eternity weeping and gnashing of teeth, and that he was the only way, the only way to the Father. That wasn't nice to our Muslim and Buddhist friends, huh? Or consider the ranting that he did in Matthew chapter 23. <clears throat> Woe to you, teachers of the, fair, of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. Woe to you, blind guides. You strain out a gnat but swallow a camel. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they're full of greed and self-indulgence. Woe to you, teachers of the law, and you Pharisees, you hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs. You look beautiful on the outside, but inside you're full of dead men's bones and everything unclean. You snakes. You brood of vipers. How will you escape being condemned to hell? Nice guy? I suppose it depends on your definition of nice, doesn't it? <coughs> What does that word mean? I mean, I thought I knew what it meant, but I did look it up. It was called a polysemantic word. Polysemantic. Poly, many, semantic words or meaning. They said, on one side, it means uh, pleasant. Um, it means uh, comfortable. It means agreeable, like we're having pleasant, nice weather. But then I really like words. I like the word roots. And so the word nice actually comes <coughs> from a, a Latin root from which we get the word nascent. Nascent mean emerging or new or immature. Like we've got a, a nascent company that's starting up. We've got a, a nascent ministry that we're dreaming. We've got a nascent idea that's beginning to stir. And in that context... The word nice in its root means naive or ignorant. 
Now, does that have any connection with Jesus? What does, so does nice mean that you're a pushover and anybody can do anything? <coughs> Maybe, sometimes. Does nice mean like you put on this uh, saccharine smile like Professor Umbridge and Perry Potter, but you will cut to the quick early on? Could be. Does nice mean that you're naive and ignorant? But none of that really, in my mind, is connected to Jesus. So is Jesus nice? Is he a nice guy? Or, how about this? Did Jesus ever say, be nice to one another? Of course, Jesus never said that. Never said that. He did say what? To love one another. To serve one another. To forgive one another. He never said be nice to one another because I'm not even sure what that means. But we do know as Christians, we, are <coughs> we ought to look, taste, and smell different from the rest of the world. Jesus has set us apart. We are called by God. We are to reflect uh, God's character and God's, God's heart. We are the light, we're the salt of the world, right? But does that mean being nice? In Ephesians 4, there's a, most of the chapter is about what it means to live as a Christian. Never once does it say, be nice to one another. But here's what it does say. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully, to your neighbor. So the first thing to be a Christian is to be truthful, is to be honest with other people. Now, you know, not like you're from New Jersey and you say, I just say it the way it is. I let the chips fall where they, will, where they may. That's just an excuse for being rude. This is, um, Paul says, speak the truth, be honest, but he says, speak the truth in love. That is, speak in a way I can hear it. I can receive it, and I want to act on it. So the first thing is to speak the truth in love, in all honesty. What else does it say? Next one. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. I love this text. It assumes that we do get angry. It doesn't say if you get angry, when you get angry. And here's the key point. Here's what sets us apart. We don't let it fester. We don't let it linger. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, which means settle it quickly. Take care of it quickly so it doesn't linger on. All right? To be honest, speak the truth in love. In your anger, make sure you don't let it fester. Settle it quickly. What else? Next one. Anyone who's, who has been stealing must steal no longer. All right, that should be a given, right? That should be a 101, that you, that you don't rob and steal things. We haven't heard nice yet. What's next? Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building up others, others up. Which makes sense. Other translations say, uh, besides wholesome, don't let evil talk, don't let foul talk, don't let abusive talk come out of your mouths. Which I kind of go back then to the confession. And all those sitcoms, the way they can rip apart another person and in 30 minutes have it all better. Got to check our tongue at the door. It's got to be truthful. It's got to be honest, but in love. It has to be in such a way that the person can hear it. Not in a way that leaves a mark, that wants to make a person sting. All right, <clears throat> next one. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. This comes from what being hurt, being angry, but not a righteous anger. Not like Jesus, you know, turning over the, the, the tables. It's not a righteous anger, it's a selfish anger. I am hurting, so I want you to hurt. I've been insulted, I want to insult you. You see the difference? 
And this kind that they're talking about, the malice is one that wants to get the last punch in and then walk away forever. That's not what we're called to do. And finally, be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgive each other just as in Christ God forgave you. That's where it all funnels. It's about reconciliation. It's about funneling those words. Not, not to leave a mark. Not to get your jab in. But for the purpose of reconciliation. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And then it ends this way. Uh, following God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, we walk in the way of love. Just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. Never once nice, because I'm not sure what that word means. But it is different from the rest of the world. Jesus called us light and salt and a beacon on a hill. Let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. As we're being sent out, we used to sing that song, they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. We ought to, we ought to be different. And that's what, that's what it's getting at. And yet, and yet we have all these stories of Jesus, who doesn't seem to be nice all the time. Throwing over tables, calling people names. You know, threatening them that they're going to weep and gnash for all of eternity. So here's my struggle. How should, we, how should we address all those times in which Jesus wasn't particularly nice? Because I, I, I come from the assumption that Jesus is the gold standard. Right? Jesus is the gold standard by which we should measure and emulate in our words and actions. And if Jesus is our gold standard, <coughs> when he's turning over tables, when he's calling people names, when he's threatening them with eternity, weeping and gnashing, may not be nice, but it's got to be good, right? And it's got to somehow reflect the very character of God. Let me pause there a second in case you were writing out your shopping list just then. Let me repeat what I'm saying here. If Jesus is the gold standard, then somehow when he's turning over tables, calling people names, threatening them with the eternity of weeping and gnashing of teeth, it must be good. And it must reflect the very character of God. And how is that? I thought about three ways. Three ways that, that make Jesus' words different than ours. Number one, that his words are not about him, but about the other person. All right? They're for the sake of the other person. So when friends and um, <clears throat> Big Bang call people names and rip apart people, it is the intention to tear them down. It is the intention to get the last call in. It is the intention to make it smart. But when Jesus calls Peter the worst name in the book, Satan, it's not to make Peter feel bad. It is to open up his eyes and say, Peter, you're thinking wrong on this. Your heart is in the wrong direction. The way to the cross will never be easy. That's the temptation from Satan. And when you're telling me to avoid the cross, you're not on the side of God, but the side of Satan. Get behind me, Satan. It is to wake him up. To see that he is aligning himself, not with God, but with the prince of this world. And when he calls the Pharisees whitewashed tombs or snakes, it's not to, not to get it to him but to helpfully open up their awareness that they're living hypocritical lives. Oh, you look all pretty on the outside, 
You're doing everything right on the outside, but inside you're rotten to the core. There's got to be some consistency in your life. It is to get them, once again, to align their lives with the very character of God. So it's not for Jesus' sake to put in that punch, but for the sake of the other to be changed. Second thing I would say is that his words sometimes are for the sake of justice and mercy. Micah 6 says, what is required of us? To act with justice, to love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. And sometimes, sometimes, that means making a stink. Sometimes that means turning over the money changer temples. Because it's not that Jesus lost it. He just lost it that day. It wasn't that. This is about justice. These poor, poor pilgrims <clears throat> would come into Jerusalem with all they had, a little dove. And they wanted to offer this for a sacrifice to God in all thanksgiving what God has done. And these money changers would say, that dove is not acceptable. It's got a blemish. You can buy our doves at an extraordinary price. These money changers were gouging God's people, <coughs> the poorest of the poor. And it was an issue of justice that he turns this over to allow everybody to have free access to God, whether or not their little dove has a mark on one of its wings. And sometimes when you speak justice, it's going to sting. The third thing, and I think this is the most important one, it's all about reconciliation. Again, when you, when, you, when you listen to the political pundits, when you watch sitcoms, it's all about division. Are you in or out? Are you on this side or that side? Are you for it or are you against it? And they create the division. But the words of Jesus are meant to draw us back into relationship with him, but with one another. And if the words don't work towards reconciliation, then they don't reflect the very character of God. Because that's what Jesus is doing. Even as he talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth, even when he says, I am the only way, it is for the sake of opening up our eyes that we may come to God and be reconciled with him and then with God with other people. See how that works? It's different, isn't it? This past week, I had a conversation with a guy who worked for one of the major banks in town. And, um, man, he was steaming. In his division here, there was a, a rumor, a reputation, a gossip about him as being mean-spirited, difficult to work with, not a team player, um, bully to other people, and it just wasn't true. There was one person that didn't like him. And that one person kept spinning, spinning stories, kept stirring the pot about this person. And as we talked, he had a plan. I'm going to go in there and call that person every name in the book. I'm going to go in there and get that person fired for what they're doing. I'm going to go in there. I mean, he had a list. He thought about it for a while. And it was going to feel good. So after he vented, I said, you know, Romans 12, chapter 18 says, insofar as it depends on you. All right? Because you can only control you. You can't control the other person. Insofar as it depends on you, live peaceably with one another. Now, if you take that verse to heart, I told him, how would you approach this situation? All those great strategies that he had went right out the window, unfortunately, because he was really looking forward to it. He said, well, I, I, would probably, I would probably go in there and tell that person, have that difficult conversation, that, that your words are not only hurting me, but hurting the whole team here. And um, 
and making it very difficult to do our work because the lack of trust in this office is just incredibly low. You know, that's that, that first step, to speak the truth, to speak the truth in love. Not with name callings or anything else, speak that truth in love. The second part is about justice. I would say, and it's wrong. The lies that, that you're saying are just simply not true. And I'm asking you to stop. See, that's direct. It may not be nice, but it's calling out the justice of the issue. And then third, I mean, I, he went through this without me doing a whole lot of you know, prompting, but a little prompting maybe. The third one, well, then I need to see if we can work together, if we can somehow salvage this working relationship so that, you know, the team can be productive again. So I'd say, all right, how can we, how can we fix this? And how can we move forward to be able to work together as a team? I said, that's right. You see, he did all the things. As Jesus, for the sake of the other person, not for me to feel good about a, a swing, for the sake of justice, this is right, this is wrong, and for the sake of reconciliation, how can we bring it back together? Insofar as it depends on you, doing what you can, live peaceably with one another. Because Jesus never said, be nice to one another. Love one another, serve one another, forgive one another. And sometimes, sometimes, if that means turning over a table or calling a person a name <clears throat> or saying this is right and this is wrong, well then, so be it. Because that's what it means to love the other person, and to speak the truth in love. Even, even if it isn't always nice. Amen.